Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just say a couple words before Tony starts here. Absolutely. Um, just want, I want to introduce Tony uh, Rosado as well as Jennifer McKim's in the back of the audience here. Uh, they've been the two main people on this project for the last four years, uh, stuck out in the middle of the EAA uh, every day, uh, you know, making sure the contractors perform the way they are supposed to, making sure that they stay under schedule, that they uh, uh, save as much money and, and bring these projects under budget. And so I just want to commend them for a great job. And, and Tony's got a nice presentation here that can I show you what he's had to live with every day. Uh, but I appreciate the board's uh, willingness to let us come up and kind of showcase some of our efforts. Thanks, Jeff. And where's Jennifer? Thank you, Jennifer. All right, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to present to you the uh, A1 Flow Equalization Basin Project. Uh, this is a uh, map of the key projects within the Governor's Everglades Restoration Strategy Plan. And the A1 FEB, um, as it's noted here on the map, uh, is part of the, uh, one of the key projects in that plan. Uh, you can see on the map it's the uh, centrally located uh, project in the blue triangle shape. The uh, design of the uh, FE, uh, A1FEB uh, is located within the central flow path and it's uh, designed to provide stormwater storage during the peak attenuations. And also the water can be delivered at a steady rate to the stormwater treatment areas uh, two to the east and also to the three, four uh, to the south. Uh, and this is for improved water treatment. Uh, water also can be supplied that was stored in the A1 FEB um, to improve the performance of these STAs through hydration during the dry season. The design uh, of the project that was provided by North Star, uh, formerly the uh, WRS Compass. Uh, the cost of the design was approximately $6.5 million and uh, the design took approximately two years. Some of the key uh, features of the project uh, includes the fact that it is built on 15,000 acre footprint and this is approximately the size of a small municipality. Uh, additionally, it was designed to hold 60,000 acre feet of water, uh, which is about a four foot average across the, the basin. We uh, constructed 21 miles of levee along with 15 water control structures and 10 of these are solar powered structures. Uh, the construction of the levees uh, was uh, uh, placed on top of the existing in situ uh, cap rock that's out there and uh, this enabled us not to have to uh, cut new channels. Um, also we utilized two existing pump stations on the project uh, to drive the water into the basin so we didn't have to build new pump stations and uh, both of these uh, are uh, uh, substantial savings in both design and construction to the uh, project. This is a uh, conceptual uh, flow plan for the basin and uh, the basin receives water from the west uh, from the Miami Canal pumped through the 372 pump station and also from the east and the New River uh, through the uh, 370 pump station. Uh, both of those are the existing pump stations I've mentioned. The water uh, passes through the uh, inlet control structures, control structures into the uh, inflow channels and the water is driven north uh, to the north end of the basin where it sheet flows uh, through the basin across the basin into the south. In the south there are a number of structures uh, that uh, we can use to control the uh, outflow of the, of the water out of the basin. Again the construction management team uh, includes Jennifer McKim, uh, she was introduced and also uh, the prime contractor on this project uh, was Central Florida Equipment Inc and they are a contractor out of the North Miami area uh, so they're, they're a regional contractor. Uh, in the construction we had 21 miles of levee construction uh, which uh, required about 1.6 million cubic uh, yards of fill material and all this material was uh, mined and processed on the site. We also utilized 75,000 cubic yards of aggregate that was uh, already uh, there on the site from previous projects. Uh, we utilized this material for bedding stone under our uh, riprap systems uh, on the levees as well as uh, in our uh, concrete for the aggregate in our concrete mixes. Again, all this material was mined and processed on the site, some of it previously. The contractor utilized more than 20, uh, 20 40 ton articulated dump trucks in the process. 
We had an aggressive construction schedule of 20 months, uh, and within that duration, we achieved substantial completion of the project. Uh, additionally, on average, uh, we had uh, 150 construction personnel daily during this period, uh, over the 20-month period. And uh, these are all local trades uh, workers as well as uh, contractors and uh, uh, materials uh, suppliers. The project also required some substantial de de muck, uh, de degrading of muck as well as backfilling of canals. And we uh, degraded about 3.1 million cubic yards of muck, spread it on the adjacent areas uh, throughout the basin. We also uh, spread it on the levee banks, as you can see in the right corner there where we spotted it. We spread that to uh, grow grass for our bank stabilization. And in addition to that, on the interior of the basin, we backfilled about 113 miles of agricultural swales and canals. Uh, some of the structures include the uh, west inflow structure. This is a three-bay roller gate structure. Um, it, the, uh, the gates are uh, fabricated out of stainless steel. Each gate weighs about 20,000 pounds. Uh, collectively, with all the 15 structures, uh, it took about 2,100 tons of steel, and this is over 4 million pounds of steel that was used to construct the structures out there. It also uh, required 16,500 cubic yards of concrete. Uh, the the uh, project has a bypass structure that was designed, which we constructed. It's unique. Uh, this is the only one uh, currently in our uh, in, in the district. Uh, it's a three-barrel, 10 by 10 concrete box culvert cast in place. Um, it connects the collection canal in the south end of uh, the perimeter of the project to the discharge outflow canal. Uh, this culvert is unique in the way that it passes underneath the eastern inflow channel. So essentially, we have one canal flowing over top of another canal. Another structure is a southeast outflow structure. And uh, if you, you saw the basin, uh, if we want to uh, remove all the water from the basin, this is kind of like pulling the, the cork out of the, out of the tub. Uh, so we can flow the water through this structure here. We can also manage water flowing through this structure uh, back into uh, the New River on the east side and also into the SDA2 to the east side of the project. The south outflow structures include uh, the 10 solar powered structures I mentioned earlier. Uh, by constructing these, uh, it eliminated the need for five additional miles of power lines to be brought in. Uh, furthermore, um, eliminated 10 uh, additional control buildings. And again, this was to a substantial savings to the project. Uh, some of the challenges that we faced out there constructing uh, was like working in a moonscape. It was very dusty and, and rocky. Um, the, uh, it required a considerable amount of blasting so that we could drive sheet pile and also uh, perform excavations uh, so that we could uh, construct the structures. Extensive dewatering was also required. Um, we employed uh, several techniques. A couple of them here is the use of temporary coffer, coffer dams where we could uh, dry out the area and uh, construct the, the structures in the dry. Uh, the, coffer, the temporary coffer dam uh, that you see on the left also um, aided in uh, managing the, the headwater in the 3-4 canal, which is probably a couple, two, three feet below the top of that structure just on the other side. We also utilized uh, trenches. Uh, we, we dug three foot wide by over 20 foot deep tr uh, trenches through the cap rock uh, so that we could uh, uh, collect the water in those locations along large uh, excavation pits. And uh, we employed large uh, dewatering pumps in those locations to uh, move the water away from the construction sites. We also uh, dug trenches outboard of these to uh, cut the, the flow of the, uh, the uh, groundwater off to, to uh, help us dry those areas out. And then the uh, massive amount of concrete that was uh, placed in this project, uh, we utilized nighttime pours for most of the large pours. And this was uh, uh, enabled us to manage the uh, control of temperature of the concrete and the placement, finishing, and also the curing processes. So in summary, um, the construction is complete on the largest flow equalization basin in Florida. Uh, so this is a big success. Uh, first, uh, this is the first restoration strategy project to be completed to date. Uh, I'd like to point out the cost of construction is $61,700,000 is well below the uh, engineer's construction cost estimates, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $10 million. 
Um, and again, uh, the district's Office of Public Affairs is currently working on a schedule for a, a ribbon, uh, ribbon break uh, cutting ceremony later this fall. So we're looking forward to that and uh, celebrating the success. We started the uh, initial in, uh, filling of the basin uh, mid-August, and we continue to put water in the basin. Uh, this is a, a shot of that. Uh, this is actually the initial uh, opening of the gates. This is the uh, inflow structure on the west side, receiving water from the Miami Canal from the west and the 372 pump station, driving water through the new structure and into the 700-foot uh, wide inflow channel, pushing the water north into the basin. Similarly, this is the uh, inflow structure on the east side of the project, and you're looking north uh, through the uh, inflow channel there. And this is the discharge uh, on the, in the uh, tailwater side of that structure, and you're looking south towards the 3-4 uh, stormwater treatment area with the 370 pump station on the left side there and also receiving water from the New River in the 3-4 canal. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Any questions? Thanks, Tony. That is that is fantastic, um, and it is really neat to to get a much better picture of what you guys are doing out there and and the and the scale of some of these projects that the district is undertaking. Um, any board questions for Tony? Uh, I got a question, but just a a, a general comment, uh, Tony and Jennifer. Um, Again, excellent job. I mean, it's really neat to see these uh, projects. I was out there, I think it was about a week, week and a half ago, got the opportunity to to uh, walk this uh, site. And uh, uh, again, the slide shows everything's out of a, a helicopter because the sheer size of these, um, I mean, this is another example of the projects that we're trying to do, water quality, water storage, and, and, and you know, the lengths that we go to be uh, fragile on the environment. Um, you know, we were out there. There's there's alligators, a lot of birds. So it's 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 neat to see after these projects are done, and you know, the wildlife is moving back in as well. Um, but uh, and again, hats off, you know, for the uh, value engineering under budget. I mean, it's amazing, and to be reusing existing pumps, um, you know, structure that's already there. Um, I think for the board, this is a excellent example of a project that makes sense. Why we have the land you know, lined up in conjunction with other uh, systems that we already had in place where um, uh, uh, able to uh, to uh, save money, but, it, it, you know, it's an excellent project. There's need to see that, so uh, nice job. Thank you. Any other board questions or comments? Melanie. Yeah, again, I, d I don't think you can really appreciate this project and understand, I mean, you look at these slides and it shows the water going in an opposite direction than it should be and then comes back around and it's just a really um, amazing show of the engineering and ingenuity that you guys come up with, not only that you're doing it with the cost savings, but the way that you're doing it is just in incredible. Congratulations. And I just want to highlight, too, because in the, one of the first slides you talked about, this project will help to hydrate our SDAs during um, our drought, you know, our dry season. And that, that's really important to recognize because that's a real issue for us with our STAs. So I think that um, we need to make sure that we, we recognize the importance of this project. And, and the fact that it's the first Restoration Strategies project completed, congratulations not only to your staff because of their leadership, but to everyone in the agency that, you know, helped make this possible. It's a, it's a huge milestone for us, and uh, I appreciate all the hard work. Any other board questions or comments? Mr. Barber. Very briefly, could you explain how the bypass structure works? The bypass structure, um, there was an existing seepage canal on the north side of the 3-4 canal uh, that now is the collection canal in the south of the basin. So it's a, a, a ditch that's uh, along that area. And we re redirected the east end of it to align with that structure so that as the water flows south in the basin, it's at its lowest point. 
and that structure is actually much lower. It actually goes, it's, it's um, elevation, and I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it actually runs underneath the inflow. Uh, in fact, you can look at the slide right now, and in the background is the uh, inflow bay to the, the southeast corner, and that structure runs um, underneath that, so it allows us to drain the water in the basin underneath that inflow channel and into an outflow channel in, in the, uh, one of the outflow structures. It is, it's not, it's a passive, it's a three-barrel three, three barrel, uh, uh, culverted structure, uh, but on the east side of that, uh, there's a canal which leads to a three-gated uh, three gated stem structure that does control the water flowing out of there. So it's a like a fixed press weir? It's not even a, a, a weir. It just literally is, as the water level uh, rises and lowers, it's just that's the elevation within that culvert. Okay. Thank you. We can get you the engineering specs on it, Mr. Barber, because <laughs> the rest of us don't know what you're talking about when you start. <laughs> but we, I, I we're glad impressed to do with <laughs> I, I would be glad to do that for you, though. Very, very impressive. Um, Mr. Mr. Moran. <clears throat> it is very impressive. Um, but let me ask you about this FEB concept. Is that something that's been used in other places in the country? And, and <clears throat> did, we, did we investigate the successes that they had with it? I'll defer to Jeff on that question, please. From an um, environmental restoration, I would say no. Um, but I think from a industry of civil engineering practice, it's something that's used extremely um, in the wastewater industry, where they, at the head of their plants, they put in large tanks to collect those peak flows, and then they treat over a 24-hour period. And so using that kind of industry standard, we applied to the environmental aspects of this, and then through our modeling, we're able to show that that additional treatment plus that stabilization of flow going into that SCA would perform uh, and give us much better performance of the SCA. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Hutchcraft. Yep. Uh, again, I, I appreciate the, the comments from the board, but I think it is absolutely worth uh, spiking the football a little bit on, on this. It, it recognizes a couple of things. One is the, uh, the, the dedication of staff, and so I appreciate all the hard work of staff, the commitment of the board to uh, advance and complete projects. Uh, and we've heard lots of conversation over the last year about, you know, we're not making progress, and I think this demonstrates that we are making progress. We're making progress in the right locations. We're doing it in a cost-effective manner. Uh, we're utilizing the resources that we have to, uh, to Im improve the water uh, flow and the water quality. Uh, and we're doing it in a manner that will maximize the effectiveness of, of our STAs. And I think our STAs have proven that they're a workhorse. Uh, and, and this is only going to maximize that. So I, I think it's, uh, it's definitely worth a, uh, a rally cry. Thank you. Th thanks, Mitch. Kevin. Um, well, I was going to follow Rick with some technical questions, but I'm going to pass <laughs> on that. Um, I, I'm with Mitch. I, I can't resist spiking the ball and, and just uh, um, e echo everything that, that you said. Massive uh, storage and treatment south of Lake It's the simple things, right? Massive storage and treatment south of Lake Okeechobee, a project that's brought in on time, a project that's brought in un under budget. Um, and, and staff, you guys have done an incredible job of, of really standing behind what this board believes in and, 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 and time and time again, finish projects, finish projects, and the momentum that comes with it. And this is great. Uh, this is awesome. Um, be a little sarcastic, but I'm sure in my local paper that we'll see the big, bold headlines above the fold uh, echoing the success of this. But it, it, re it, really, it really is. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Batchelor. Um, ditto on all the comments from the board members. And thank you for your good presentation. I just think, in addition, it shows the public how effective and wonderfully their taxpayer dollars are being used. It's prima facie evidence that we have some of the best and the brightest scientists and engineers working on behalf of our people in this state. So I would ask you to also to continue to bring the projects forward, particularly for us that are not non-engineer, the pretty pictures and everything. It really is 
It's very impressive. So thank you to each and every one of you. Ex excellent comment, Sandy. I, I, I agree. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Any public uh, comment? Yes, sir. We have one. Mark Perry. <clears throat> Mr. Perry, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Governing Board. Um, Mark Perry, Florida Ocean Graphic. Um, these technical reports are always really good to see, and I'm glad you added a new one, which is a project uh, spotlight, which will help to really kind of bring the board and everybody up to speed on uh, some of these projects. And it is exciting that they get completed and, and we see them actually operating. Up in the Upper East Coast Basin, basically, we've got a lot of inflow from C44, C23, C24, and even 10 Mile Creek at the Gordy Road structure. All of those have two to five to 600 CFS coming through about 922 million gallons a day, uh, which has dropped the salinity, as you saw in, in Terry Bates's presentation at the Roosevelt Bridge in the middle of shore down to eight parts per thousand, which is pretty low for even oyster and, and out in the outer estuary to 15 parts per thousand, which is kind of the critical limit for seagrass. So we're anxious to get projects, of course, up in that area, which we'll talk about in the integrated delivery schedule and others, but <clears throat> that is important to know that those structures are controlled also at the district level and whatever we can do to store and treat water and hold water back in those canals rather than dumping them out into the estuary is, is going to be helpful. I think when we see the lake going at 13 and a half feet right now and about 12,000 CFS coming in, that's 7.7 .7 billion gallons a day coming in and only 43 CFS going out to the south. It's like 27 million gallons a day going out. This, this really shows the need right now. We've got a critical time that's setting up almost like 1970, 1997-98. And I remember those times well because we were in a dry season. Nobody was thinking in January that the lake would jump right up uh, to critical levels and we'd start discharging both east and west. And all the way through April got critical discharges uh, because the lake rose so fast because of El Nino. And this El Nino is setting up to be even stronger perhaps than that other one. So a big word of caution is right now when maybe we even have capacity in the A1 um, FEB here, maybe we ought to start moving some more water out of the lake south. The canals are all at about 9.8 or 10 feet in elevation. We have capacity, we can move it south and perhaps uh, store it in the FEB and then move it in through the STAs and so forth down the line. So I'm glad to see a project's underway to hold, help store and treat this water moving it south. And maybe now's a critical time to use that. So I, I really hope that we do that. And also the Florida Bay issue, we were at RAC as Mr. Moran uh, indicated, uh, that's a really critical thing to get some flows down into Florida Bay and help alleviate those uh, salinities. Um, and then lastly, uh, Mr. Moran mentioned the suction dredge. And don't forget that in the IRL South plan, which is the authorized appropriated plan, that there are about 7.9 million cubic yards of muck that needs to be removed out of the St. Lucie Estuary Indian River. So. We could use a suction dredge down there and we get some practice with it and then we could, we could get it up to our spot and start using it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Okay. Um, actually, Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move agenda item 37 down to we're going to do that after agenda item 40. And let's skip to uh, agenda item 38, which is exotic vegetation control at the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. And Karen will give us an update on that. Yeah, so I'm just going to do some introductions and staff's going to do two presentations. But before we um, get to our two presentations this morning on the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, I'd like to acknowledge some of our state and federal partners that have joined us in the audience today. Uh, Ernie Martin.